Hello, everyone, and a welcome to my second take. Actually, yesterday, I'm sorry, there was a huge mess and uh, with the technology, and I couldn't really manage to make it happen. But uh, by God's grace, I'm here. I'm again in front of you and doing this show. So thank you again for coming again today and uh, sparing your time for this. So let us begin this time uh, with a word of prayer. Um, Okay. Lord Father, we commit this time into your hands. Let it not be my words, but your words. Let it be not my intellect, but your intellect. Reach out to those people, Lord. Let my reach words reach out to those people who are yearning to know you and love you. Let my, let my words be seasoned with encouragement and love that can reach out to the people you have chosen. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, pray and receive. Amen. So uh, thank you everyone again, and here we are um, on this live, live, live uh, broadcast with you. And uh, thank you again for coming. <clears throat> so just to give a brief preface of what is going on, I um, had a debate with Dr. Shoaib Sayed. Uh, he's an ex-colleague of uh, Mr. Zakir Naik, and uh, he apparently had debated, not apparently, he had debated uh, the great Sam Shamoon and uh, even after being thrashed by Sam, he uh, debated, I believe, uh, Dr. Samuel Green and then to apparently reinvent his apologetical career, he thought of debating me. And by God's grace, even that was a huge mistake for him, he got thrashed twice. And then instead of coming for the third and fourth and fifth debate that was promised, he decided to make small repetition videos, again, repeating the same points. So I thought of instead of making the same videos again, let me just have a live event and let me ask people to come forth and uh, speak. So uh, that is where it was. So I decided to host this event. And uh, of course, thank you again for being there. So I have made a brief presentation on uh, uh, answering Dr. Shoaib Sayed, and here I'm just going live with it. Just give me a second. All right. So I hope you can see my screen on this. And uh, so that is my, my first day. That's what I've named the video as. Um, beating an Islamic scholar with 40 facts. And why do I say that? Well, the reason is um, this. You can beat 40 scholars with one fact, but you can't beat one idiot with 40 facts. Uh, um, this is attributed to Rumi, the scholar Rumi. And uh, so that, that's where it is. And uh, I really hope uh, to showcase, I've already done that once earlier. So I really hope to take the case ahead and show you how Islamic scholars cannot really be um, you know, beaten up um, or accept the, the outward consequence or the inward consequence of logic, even when uh, faced with 40, 80, or even 100 odd, uh, you know, facts. The general rules of today, uh, please be civil in your comments and avoid any sort of personal attacks on anybody to whom sorry is there. And if you're, uh, you can, if you're there on uh, Facebook, you can uh, post it in the comment section, I'll take it up. Please be as clear and concise in, in every manner. And only questions pertaining to the subject on this video would be taken up. And uh, in case you're watching it on YouTube, we can put it in the comment section. And uh, in case you're watching it post facto, that is after this event has gone live, uh, what will happen is that uh, you can always uh, post it in the in the comment section below, and I will definitely, most definitely, get back to you on that. All right. So I was really wondering earlier when I used to debate, uh, you know, this Muslims and all that, why do they are so averse using their brains? And then I noticed this verse that you can also think about it. Uh, Quran chapter 5 verse 101, O ye who believe, ask the Lord questions about things which if made plain to you, 
may cause you trouble. So Allah is actually saying, do not ask questions in case you're a believer, because it may cause you trouble. But then he says also that if you have any things, when the Quran is being revealed, they will be made plain to you. So that is at the time of Muhammad. Now, since you're not there at the time of Muhammad, you are really advised whether by Allah not to use your brains. Why? Because verse 102, Allah answers the question. Some people before you died did ask such questions and on that account lost their faith. So Allah is saying, in short, if you're living now, all my Muslim friends, in case you ask questions, Allah is saying, don't ask questions because in case you do, you lose your faith. So Allah is actually encouraging you to keep your brains on the side and just take whatever is there for granted. And that's what we see in Dr. Shoaib Sayyid also. From the get-go, now what I've done is that I have taken screenshots from his video, okay? I've not really, uh, what you see in the middle of it, you know, all these age-old questions not answered and stuff. Uh, this is not me, it is what he has put, so I'm answering that, you know? And again, as I said, in case you have any questions, you can always ask, uh, put it in the comments and I will get back to you immediately on this, within this presentation itself. So he says, you started your question, your presentation complaining that Sam Shaman had already replied the same oft repeated questions. Uh, and he also goes on to say, Jesse ki, uh, Dr. Naik, uh, Dr. Zakir Naik or Ramad Didat ka naam liye bagayar aapka khana hazam nahi hota. Aray, Shoaib sahab, agar unka naam hum sun lete na, humara khana kharaab ho jata hai. Hazma kharaab ho jata hai. Woh naam lene se khana muh mein nahi jata. To khana hazam ho nahi ki baat hi nahi hai. Okay. Problem is that you are using the same arguments again and again and again, even though they have been answered many times. And you behave as if those were never answered. And I'll prove it to you today because whatever you have raised, I had answered it, but you still behave dumb about it because of Quran chapter 5, verse 101 and 102. So then he says, um, they, they are actually not answered. For example, he says about Isaiah 53. Uh, Mr. Narendra Sahu, why caught Isaiah 53 when rising back from the dead, the third day is not mentioned in Isaiah 53. Well, go back to the debate, both the debates. And he says, where is the resurrection mentioned in the Bible? Sam clarified it. I clarified it. Same words. And when I clarified it again and I ham hammered the nail in the coffin of that argument of Dr. Syed, I had said at that time that now you'll come up with a new argument and say that, okay, now show where is the three days and three nights in the Bible, in, in the Bible. And that is exactly what you did. You brought up that argument again. And you said, show me where uh, rising from the dead third day is written. And he says, it's not mentioned in Isaiah 53. Yeah, it's not mentioned in Isaiah 53. Why do you want the, the Quran, the Bible to be uh, written as per your instructions? This is not the Quran, which was written as per the expectations of Muhammad. You know, even Aisha, it is written in the Sahih Hadith, who says that it almost seems like Allah runs to satisfy the desires of your heart. Aisha, the child bride, you know, the one who uh, Muhammad married at uh, when she was five years old and then, uh, you know, had sex with her when she was nine and he was 54. Uh, she said, she noticed that there is something askew and... Uh, she said that this is it. That is your Allah hastens to satisfy the desires of your heart. So the, the Quran was written as per the requirements of Muhammad, but the Bible was not required, written as per the requirements of what I want it to be or you want it to be. It was written by God himself, the sovereign God himself. So the three days, three nights, yes, it is written in the Bible. Here it is. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 41. A wicked and adulterous generation ask for a sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then the, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation condemned. Okay. So over here, your boss ka boss, Dr. Sayed, your, the boss of your boss, Ahmad Dida, does a big notanki, the melodrama, the dramatics. And he says, how was Jonah in the belly of the whale? And the church scream, and the people scream, alive, alive, alive. How was Jesus in the, in, the, in, the, in the grave? Was he alive or dead? And all, everybody says dead. So how can he say, how can it be the same? The sign of Jonah was not the crucifixion or the death of Jesus Christ. So he says that it was a fake prophecy. 
Now, is that it? Let us just investigate. I have covered this in my uh, uh, Sakshi channel. It is, you can see it in detail on Sakshi channel uh, in the sign of Jonah. There is a video on that, on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in which we had covered all the arguments of the so-called embarrassments to Islam, uh, the so-called apologists who are in essence embarrassments to Islam, Zakir Naik and Ahmad Didar, on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they have been answered thoroughly. One of them is the sign of Jonah, and I'm just giving a gist over here. Now, the comparative statements of Jesus is there in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 45 that I just read. And then in John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21, here too, Jews ask for a sign. And he says to destroy the temple and he'll build it in three days. In Matthew chapter 12, you notice something? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 45, the Jews ask Jesus for a sign. And he says the sign of Jonah. Now, you are expecting it to be about the death of Jonah. I'll come to that also. But then let us read John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. All these signs, whenever the Jews, whenever the Jews asked him for a sign, he was referring to his death and resurrection. And he says uh, in John chapter 2, verse 19, here too the Jews ask for a sign, and he just says to destroy the temple and he'll build it in three days. And everybody says, This is built, took like 40 years. How can you build it in three days? And there it is also written that he was referring to his uh, death and resurrection. John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus compares his death and resurrection to Moses raising the bronze snake in the desert. Now, let me do the same notanki, the melodrama that uh, Zakir Naik does and uh, your boss, boss Ahmad Dida did, uh, did. How was the bronze snake on the cross in the desert when he was raised, the bronze snake? Was he dead or alive? It was dead. It was a dead, inanimate object. So, can we not... Uh, synonymize it with the uh, uh, you know with the death of Jesus Christ himself. Then in Matthew chapter 21 verse 37 to 38, he compares it to the son of the owner, that is his death and resurrection of the vineyard. What happened to the son of the owner? He was beaten to death by the tenants of the owner. John chapter 12 verse 23 to 25, he compares it to a grain of wheat which dies when put into ground, but then brings new life. And he says, unless the grain of wheat dies it will not give new life. He was referring to himself. In all these things, it was referring to his death and resurrection. Now, I don't know whether, no, don't know whether you even understand in your madrasa where you went. I hope you did not become a doctor in your madrasa. Dr. Shoyal. In the uh, English language, when you're talking about such a sim you know, similitude or metaphor, it does not mean that... Uh, you know, um, all the aspects have to match. The hearer has to be intelligent enough to understand the, you know, um, the aspects of the metaphor. For example, I'll give you, you may call your wife or your girlfriend, you know, uh, you are allowed to have four at least. So uh, you can call, you may call her a moon. You look like the moon, you are uh, like the moon. What if the your wife and your girlfriend slap you and say, Oh, the moon, you compare me to the moon. The moon is dead. It is cold. It is lifeless. So are you telling me that I am dead? I am cold. I am lifeless. What would you say? You would be looking at him, looking at your wife, wives and girlfriends with that look in the face. And you will be asking, are you stupid? And this is what I am asking you at this time, Dr. Shari Shoy. Are you stupid? Do you not understand? This is a metaphor. It is a way of speaking. So here also, like you may say, oh, by my, this great man, he is like the sun. You are, you are referring to the, the aspect of giving light. What if that guy comes and beats you up and says, do you think I'm red, I'm burning, and I kill everything in, in and around me? Because the sun is extremely hot. Even lead will melt on the sun. So that is where English language comes into place. So let us see another aspect of it. What did the Jews believe about Jonah? In the Zohar Vehicle, which is one of the, the foremost book on mysticism by uh, the Jews of the Jews. Also, uh, it's used by the Kabbalah. 
it is related that the fish died as soon as jonah entered but it was revived after 3 days when jonah was thrown into the sea his soul immediately left his body and soared up to god's throne where it was just and sent back as soon as it touched the mouth of the fish on its way back to the body the fish died but was later restored to life the fish's name was given in whatever uh, shashilet ha kabala that is whale the fate of jonah is allegorized in the johar bible as illustrative of the soul's relation to the body and to death in the assumption that jonah is identical with the messiah the son of joseph the influence of christian thought is discernible so jesus was not talking to an amadida he was talking to first century jews the jews knew what jesus was talking about the jews knew first of all they were smart enough to know they were not a muslim at that time thankfully mohammed was not there so there was still a uh, lot of intelligent people in and around the saudi in the palestinian area in the middle east so they knew that this is a allegory it is a metaphor so they knew how to interpret it also and even if they did not the first century jews believed that jonah died and he came back to life so either ways even if i agree with you you are wrong even if i disagree with you you are still wrong take it either ways so then coming to the next the seemingly unanswerable that you said isaiah 53 was not regarding jesus at all that is what you are saying that the isaiah was not that this thing is not about isaiah at all and why do you why do you believe in that why do you say that okay so uh, why do you say that let us just look this up now okay yeah i just lost track of my uh, slide all right so isaiah 53 66 chapters are written before 740 bc past sentences were used which put the incidents before 740 bc and uh, so he says no this is not a prophecy prophecy has to be future yes a prophecy is future because it is not written by muhammad Muhammad couldn't even get the past and the present right. Forget the future. Isaiah was writing about the future. Now you might say that the past tense was used. Well, yes, because the prophet was not speaking. It was the hand of God. And in the mind of Christ, in the mind of God, these things have already happened in time infinite. He can see everything. For him, the past, present, and future is the same. There is no difference. that's why he calls himself he says at one time the lord says uh, i am the god of the living and not the dead and other other place he says i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob long after they have died in the mind of god that's not the case a mind in in the eyes of god everything is there so secondly he says uh, you cannot assume for future that he says i say 52 starts addressing jerusalem as singular pronouns that would like die etc now this was a argument which was used uh, you quote even isaiah 52 uh, by even by somebody like a uh, shabir ali who is i believe one of the finest uh, you know debaters of islam and uh, i wouldn't say that uh, somebody like a zakir naik is fit enough to even untie his shoelaces in that way he is uh, is that uh, he has the guts to come up and for a debate and he also used to use this dialogue this particular uh, lecture this particular uh, argument but then he has stopped using that that's not there anymore the reason being the there was debates and all these things were discussed out but he is not like you who keeps on bringing old points that have already been answered again and again so let me answer this now the, the next after that you said zera does not mean spiritual sense or metaphysical sense jesus was not married and he had no sons so all those things you are saying there is no verse in the bible let me say there is no verse in the bible which says spiritual sense or metaphysical sense the concept of such sense is missing fine i'll give you everything now watch and learn this is sunday school 101 for dr shoaib sayar so whom does isaiah 52 refer to and here we see what do the early rabbis say our ancient commentators with one accord noted that the context speaks clearly of god's anointed one the messiah the aramic 
translator of this chapter translation of this chapter ascribed to rabbi jonathan who is a disciple of hillel who was at the time of jesus christ who lived early in the second century itself begins with a simple and worthy words behold my servant messiah shall prosper he shall be high and increase and be exceedingly strong as the house of israel looked to him through many days because of their countenance was darkened among the peoples and the complexion beyond the sons of men and he says the targum in that in the targum jonathan which is our commentary on isaiah 53 and he says this is about the messiah and then the babylonian talmud see i'm quoting the jewish uh, scriptures now it's not messiah this is not the bible the jews would never uh, present it in that way. orthodox jews still do not take jesus christ as the messiah so this is nothing that somebody wrote something to flatter the christians now what is his name the rabbi said his name is the leper scholar as it is written surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him a leper smitten of god and afflicted and then we see an explanation of ruth 2:14 in the midrash raba and he is speaking of the king messiah come hither draw near to the throne and dip thy morsel in the vinegar this refers to the chastisements as it is said but he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the zohar in its interpretation of isaiah 53 points to the messiah again there is in the garden of eden a palace named the the palace of the sons of sickness this palace the messiah enters and he summons every pain and every chastisement of israel all of this come and rest upon him and had he not thus lightened them upon himself there had would have been and there had been no man able to bear israel's chastisement for the transgressions of the law as it is written surely our sicknesses he has carried zohar 2212a so the zohar 2 also speaks says that the mystical book of the jews also says that isaiah 53 points to the messiah <coughs> now look at this if we read uh, verse 8 uh, of uh, Isaiah fifty three. It says, "By operation and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his judge, of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was uh, he was stricken." And he says, "This word says that he will be cut off from the land of the living." And the question is, were the Jewish people ever, God forbid, cut off from the land of living? Absolutely not. because the bible itself says in jeremiah chapter 31 verse 36 that only the decree is the sun to shine by day the moon and the stars to shine by night vanished from my sight declares the lord will the descendants of israel ever cease to be a nation before me then we see is israel stricken for israel because of israel sin because here we see for he was cut off from the land of a living for the transgression of my people he was stricken so if this person or this thing that is being referred to here is jerusalem not is jerusalem and not jesus christ the messiah then how would you interpret this israel was stuck for the transgression of israel for the sins of israel and he is just, israel is a sin bearer how is it possible the transgression of his sins was upon him how can the one who's taking the sin of somebody else and the sinner both be the same again simple logic is israel without sin then because we read in verse 9 he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth how can israel be the servant the one who had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth how can israel be because israel you read brothers uh, and sisters please read the holy bible in the uh, 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 starting from um, isaiah uh, lo- looking at the lamentations looking at jeremiah looking at habakkuk looking at malachi on and on and on there is just judgment upon israel why was israel judged and punished that is because they were they had deceived in them they had did disobeyed the lord Uh, their god our god so that is where they were punished so how can 
the one how can israel as per verse 9 how can it be israel how can it be jerusalem because here it is said jerusalem had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth there is no way that these verses can refer to jerusalem it was referring to the messiah and here we see a 14th century rabbi rabbi moshe cohen ibn crispin of cordoba and he says if israel of israel as servant interpretation it says it distorts the passage from its natural meaning and it isaiah 53 was given of god as a description of the messiah whereby when any should claim to the be the messiah to judge by the resemblance or non resemblance to it whether he were the messiah or not so what he is saying is that isaiah 53 was given by god to the jews as a benchmark against which they can validate who is the messiah so here are the attributes of the messiah and here whom you think is the messiah does the attributes match if yes then he is the messiah and jesus christ my lord and savior your lord and savior muhammad's lord and savior of course he, he is not saved any he is not saved he is in hell he is the one who of whom isaiah 53 is speaking about then it speaks then you say the seed of as mentioned in isaiah 53 verse 10 now this is really something stay with me on this brothers and sisters and if you are a muslim i really appeal to you to hang on to this he says the zera is used in a spiritual manner he is referring to verse 10 but then we see in isaiah 1 verse 4 a sinful nation a people laden with iniquity a seed zera of evil doers children that are corrupt they have forsaken the lord they have provoked the holy one unto anger so here also the word zera is taken a zera of evil doers and uh, those shall not be joined the 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 zera of evil doers shall be uh, shall be renowned now it is talking about uh, offspring in a physical or even in a metaphorical manner it is not talking about a person in particular isaiah 14 verse 20 then again we see the zera of the adulterer and the whore a zera of falsehood because dr sayed you said zera is never used metaphorically isaiah 57 verse 3 to 4 a zera of falsehood what does it mean it's a metaphor in our does falsehood have a offspring physical offspring now isaiah also does not say that the servant will see his own seed the word simply says that the word will see the servant will see seed just as the following translations confirm we see that in the uh, orthodox jewish bible yet it please the hashem to bruise him that is the same 53 verse ten yet it please him to bruise god to bruise him he has put him to suffering and and when shall we, uh, when you shall make him an offering for sin he shall see offspring he shall prolong his days and the pleasure will of the lord shall he shall prosper in his hand moshiach that is the messiah's hand so and then we see in the dot net uh, dot net bible also the same verse verse 10 though the lord desire to crush him and make him ill once restitution is made he will see descendants and enjoy long life and the lord's purpose will be accomplished through him now in some translations of the holy bible like say nkjv niv or something you do see the word he will see his descendants but then if you go back to the originals or if you read the translations in entirety the word his these pronouns are you know put in italics meaning those words have been put over there inserted over there for better meaning but they are not a part of the original manuscripts Now, according to isaiah now look at this now you may say uh, it is never speaking about uh, uh, you know future generation or a metaphorical uh, you know seed or spring isaiah 45 verse 18 according to isaiah yahweh our lord and savior our lord our father god has sworn to save and justify that is make righteous the seed of his people israel for thus said the lord who that created the heavens and earth god himself that formed the earth and it says i said unto the seed of jacob la zera the word is used over there and towards end it says the all the seed of israel shall be justified isaiah 45 verse 18 the same word is used the same word is used it's metaphorical by nature let us see in the in uh, uh, in the old testament and then to the new the lord explains sorry isaiah explains through the word of the lord how and the way 
the the Yahweh does this, that is to save and justify, is for the servant to die as a vicarious sacrifice for all their sins, as well as for the sins of the nations. And then we see that in Isaiah 53, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, Zerah. And then he says, for he shall bear their iniquities. And we see that justify many. It shall justify many. He shall see, see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall be my, shall, by his knowledge shall my righteousness, righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. And then the Psalms confirms this uh, interpretation. It speaks of the seed which will come to glorify and to serve God. And we see that I declare thy name unto my brethren, where God is calling him, uh, his children, brethren also. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. All the seed, the seed Zerah of Jacob, the seed Zerah of Israel, a seed Zerah shall serve him. And that's what is seen in uh, Psalms 22. And then the Bible says very clearly that the followers of Christ are, are the very spiritual seed of God, a spiritual metaphorical seed of God. And this is so beautiful. Of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 to 18. In bringing many sons unto glory to make captain of their salvation, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. Behold, I and the children which God has given me like unto his brethren. And if behold, where, and, we, uh, and uh, going down, we see Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. We are all spiritual seed of God. I am a child of God. And this is what I read in the Holy Bible, John chapter 1, verse 10 to 13. And the world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came unto his own and by his own received him not. And many as received him, for he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I am a child of God. This is so awesome. This is so awesome. I wish I could show you. My hair is standing on end just reading these verses. John chapter 11, verse 49 to 52. Uh, but that also you should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. The children of God. You will not understand this. If you are a Muslim, I feel sorry for you. You will not understand this. You are a slave of Allah. Allah, you'll never hear his voice. You'll never see him. Even what you know about Allah is what Muhammad said was told to him what he thought was an angel of God. Nobody ever heard or seen the angel. Even Muhammad had never seen or spoken to Allah himself. But my Christ, when we are there in heaven, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that Christ will be with us. We are, not child, we are not slaves. We are children of God. I am a seed of God. I am a seed of God. And look at this. John chapter 20 verse 17. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father. He's, Jesus Christ is saying his father, father God is also my father. Also my father, the maker of heaven and earth. And then he says in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 to 7, that we are might that, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because we are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba. In the Middle East, the first word that is taught to a child is Abba. Ab, Abba. And that is what we get to call God Himself, Abba. You will never understand this, Dr. Sayyid. As a Muslim, you will never understand this. You will never have the privilege until you come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then we see again in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, 8 to 10, 23 to 24. And we see that uh, the Father is, uh, the, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Behold, now we are the sons of God. Who is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. His seed remains in him, me. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. 
and this is the command meant that we should believe the name of his son jesus christ and love one another as he gave his command commandment to us and hereby we know that he abided in us by the spirit which he has given us not a slave but a child if you are a muslim i really encourage you to buy this book i dare to call him a father it's there on amazon and if you want you can um, text me um uh, a message directly with your address and i will have it sent to you i'll courier a book to you at my cost if you are a muslim and you would like to read this book i read a dare to call him father please message me on the sakshi page facebook page if you are in, if you are a, if you are watching this on comments you can still go to our sakshi uh, apologetics network facebook page and write me a private message and uh, with your address and i will courier it to you but this is a book that you must read the struggles of a muslim woman in the middle east dared to call him father bilkis sheik then he says coming to the next thing christianity and paganism he says there were many like jesus you said show one person in history that had that a similar incident like jesus in everything i understand that the quran has no context you just read random verses here and there but that was a debate there is something that i said before that i gave what similar in what way all the hands the attributes of god that jesus had i'm talking from that that side and what does dr shoyab say it does imagine the death of uh, using your brains he quotes mitra artis odysseus romulus dionysius heracles he says these are all like jesus really you are quoting to me mythological fictional characters against a a historical figure of jesus christ really that's your argument a sample of deceit from again the islamic scholar and he says this is again his quote he says where did jesus say i am worship and god worship me and i counter questioned him actually in a rhetorical way uh, that is where did jesus say that i am a prophet and do not worship me and he says and dr sayed says that it's not a rhetorical question and he should be answering it and then he mumbles a few things and then he says what rubbish logic abraham moses etc never uh, even they did not say do not worship me most in the world did not say do not worship me so should we start worshiping all of them again this is madrasa logic you will get that only if you are a quran follower only if you are a quranic follower if you are an idol worshiper also your brains won't be this bad dr sayed even an idol worshiper knows how to use his brains this is utter rubbish i am telling you because if you if anybody sees that video and if you have not seen it in the link below i put down the link to the debates and you will see over there that i have said very clearly that is i am not saying that any christian says that they worship jesus christ because he said i am i am i am a prophet and do not worship me and you can and do not worship me uh, 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 so we we worship him we no no christian uses such logic so no christian uses such logic i never gave that as an argument so why are you trying to answer such a silly argument is it that you are not able to follow uh, you know serial logic so this is it jesus a prophet and said do not worship me he says uh jesus uh, john chapter 4 verse 44 jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his country this is why i said dr sayed that is people like you keep repeating the same arguments again and again even though they have been answered and I answered at that time me or anybody not honoring an honor worthy person doesn't mean that they are not honorable there could be your own uh, you know allah and muhammad whom i do not honor does it mean that they are not god allah is not god i do not honor muhammad does it mean muhammad is not a prophet no so there were people who do not honor jesus christ even at that time even now and even 
at the time that Muhammad gave this verse, that Muhammad was preaching in uh, Makkah, Medina, even at that time, there were people who did not honor, did not believe in uh, Muhammad and his God, Allah. Okay, most of them, uh, Muhammad uh, converted at the sword or killed them or raped them or sold them as slaves. But there were people who did not believe and honor Allah and Muhammad. So does it mean that Allah is not a God because he was not honored in his holy ground? That is your logic. For Jesus himself, then he says, um, you know, <clears throat> okay, he says the same thing, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines. It's, anyway, I'll go on. Uh, this is, now, this is, as for the logic of Dr. Sayyid, Allah is without honor and therefore not God. This is a book on Amazon from Mecca to Christ. He is the son of uh, the Meccan Mufti. The topmost priest in Mecca, his son has come to Christ. He does not honor Allah. He does not honor Muhammad. And if you read his book, he says how he was the price of daring to leave Islam. He was imprisoned, beaten, tortured, shot at with bullets. His face still bore the scars of previous persecution. And even does now. There are people now, even now in Mecca, who do not honor uh, Allah. They might not have left Islam, but they, but they can't because you have the, the penalty for apostasy in Saudi Arabia is death. You and your religion keep a sword on the neck of the people and then claim that it is the fastest growing religion. Remove the sword, remove the foot from the neck of people and then see what happens. This is another book. So I have proven over here that as per the logic of Dr. Sayyid, Allah is without honor and therefore as per Dr. Sayyid, Allah is not God. And here I try to, I teach because I have taught Bible to Dr. Sayyid and now I am teaching him Islam. And then he says that I asked him a question, where did Allah say to Muhammad, I am God, worship me? And he says, I thought it is uh, such a verse is not a seriously. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not an Abdul. I am a Christian. I am a child of God. I use my brains. I'm told to use my brains. Love the Lord your God with the whole mind, soul and strength. So I use my brains. And you really think I would have come up with that question had I not known your answer and a counter to that? You really think you have shown me a verse that I didn't know? You quoted Quran chapter 20 verse 14. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no deity except me. So worship me. Now, assuming that this verse is right in the context that you are saying, I gave the criterion. Where did Allah say to Muhammad, I am God, worship me in those very words. But here, indeed, I am Allah is one side. Then after four or five words, he says, so worship me. Now, if I would answer your challenge in that way, where did Jesus Christ say, I am God, worship me? There is some parts where he says, I am God, and there is some parts he says, worship me, or he accepts worship. You will not let it be put together, but here you've got, I am God, I am Allah, or here I am God, and then he says, I am worship me over here, and you are expecting me to put it together. Those That verse is not there. Even if I give it to you, but even if I give it to you, you're wrong, and if I don't give it to you, you're still wrong. Let me show you how. Some context in the context less. Interestingly, the Quran, which is a mindless jumble of verses, has some context somewhere. And in this case, it has some context. Quran chapter 20 verse 14 that Dr. Sayyid quoted. We have to get the context of verse 9. And if you read verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, and then verse 14, you will see that from verse 9, it speaks about the story of Moses and the burning bush. Behold, he saw a fire. So he said to my to his family, Tarry, uh, perceive a fire. Perhaps I can bring you some burning brand thereof or find some guidance at the fire. And then he says, Oh Moses, and all those things. So you see, these verses were given to Muhammad. No, this was given to Moses. So the, the challenge stands and you have failed. Even if I agree with you, you have failed. 
Even if I disagree with you, you have still failed. Either side, you have failed. This verse, you can say, okay, this was given to Muhammad. Yes, Allah told Muhammad what had happened to Moses. So the verse initially was given to Moses, not Muhammad. And then he says again, honor does not make unto God. And then he says, that I quoted John chapter 5 verse 33 that all men should honor the son even as you honor the father. He that honors not the son honored. This is so crazy. I've answered this in the debate and still you're going on and on. Such a senseless manner you are, you behave in. And you gave the example even at that time that if there is a dog that comes uh, with my friend Praveen and if I honor the dog and I honor Praveen. Now tell me, I have I have like three dogs. I love dogs. Uh, of course, if you are a Muslim, you are not supposed to be having dogs because as per uh, the hadith, if there is a dog in the house, then the word of God can't come. So you see, the dog is more powerful than the word. Angel cannot come if there is a dog in the house. So, but I have three dogs, but my God is so powerful that no matter who is there, where I am, his word comes to me. I am there with him. Because he is my father. That's so awesome to say that. <laughs> okay. So uh, can you have for God honor in this world? And he says, so here, even if I am honoring my friend, as much as I'm honoring my dog, actually he'll be offended. I would love the dog. Maybe I'll give him some biscuits and maybe some milk and Allah puto to me, puchu, 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 I'll do. But can I be, treat my friend in the same way? He'll be offended. What if you come to my house, Dr. Sayed, and there is a dog in my house, and I treat you and the dog as the same, would you be okay with it? You'd be offended. Can I, can, are, are you okay if a Muslim honors you at the same level, they, they honor, forget Allah, Muhammad. Allah is God, right, for you. And Muhammad is a messenger for you. Will you be okay if somebody honors you as much as they honor Muhammad? Would you be okay with that? Would you be okay if a Muslim honors you and Muhammad in the same breath? No. If you are an orthodox Muslim, it's hardly highly offensive for you and blasphemous. And so here, to make up a silly logic, you say that. But that was not the only thing. There was honor, attribute, name, you know, a designation, seed, everything is there. So Deuteronomy, then he says, Deuteronomy 6.30, he says, I, in the first debate, I quoted Deuteronomy 6 verse 30 does not exist. And then he says, you, you took the support of honor from Deuteronomy 6 verse 30, but the last verse is 6 verse 25. There is no verse after 25. You know, Dr. Sayed, had you not gone to a madrasa, but gone to a proper school, school, and the teacher is very fast dictating something in your writing. And suddenly, the, uh, you know, if the teacher says, uh, go, to, um, go to page number, page number, chapter number 60, chapter number 6, and go to uh, line number 30. But the um, book or the chapter ends at line number 25. You know, if you are a student having the basic intelligence, you will immediately think, because I used to think. Maybe I heard wrong and it is not 30, it is 13 or some other thing, you know, 3 or 13, something that sounds similar to 30. That is basic common sense. But being a Muslim has taken away from you even that part. I actually said Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and he shall take oaths in his name alone. I was quoting 6 verse 13 not 30. So hallelujah to my Lord and Savior for giving me the sense to not become a Muslim. As you might have seen my testimony, it's there on the channel. When I was searching for God, I want us, almost all my close friends are Muslims. I really investigated Islam very clearly, but honestly, it was not making sense. And that is where I, you see the tendency of uh, Dr. Sayed, so when the debate is lost, slander becomes a tool. So uh, he gives, he starts giving names and you can see uh, uh, that in the next allegation, he say, calls me, he puts shame on me and he says, I'm cheating. And he says, 
you quoted but understand the opposite matthew verse 4 verse 10 said those who worship the lord your god and him you shall serve alone you also say jesus received worship uh, quoting matthew chapter 32 verse 33 but it says matthew chapter 4 verse ends at 25 matthew chapter 4 verse 32 to 33 does not exist and the same thing i'm saying had he not been a muslim you would have been a smart man you call yourself a doctor do you actually graduate from the same madrasa to be a doctor i'm just asking seriously just asking i was not quoting 4 verse 10 4 verse 32 to 33 i was quoting 14 verse 32 to 33 and when they climbed down into the boat the wind died down then those who were in the boat worshiped jesus worshiped him worship the messiah worship the son of god and saying truly you are the son of god so hallelujah to my lord and savior for not making me a muslim for ensuring i don't become a muslim so that was the end of my first series in the refutation of uh, um refutation no answering rather if i can put it that way <laughs> so yeah okay so hallelujah to everyone i just got a message uh, <laughs> uh okay uh, so i just got a confirmation i hope it's a confirmation from our dear praveen pagdala that uh, dr sayed uh, sayed shoaib sayed has agreed to debate me next three topics right so that's what he's saying so i i hope he does that and if you are a muslim i i challenge you to our debate on the crucifixion and resurrection of jesus christ there is the good friday and easter coming up so please uh, if you are a muslim even in hindi if you want to debate the challenge stands and you can reach out and uh, i'll be more than willing to take it up and if you are dr sayed i still await your uh, taking up the challenge of uh, paul and uh, jesus which is uh, uh in a paul and muhammad sorry which is a be better uh, apostle of god who who's a true apostle of god you know what i can i'm even you know i'm even willing to take up the challenge of um uh, i you know from whatever i see of you dr sayed i can even debate you on the topic dr shoaib sayed and your prophet who is a better example for human kind and i'll prove it to you that you are a better example for human kind than your prophet that is how it is and i look forward to you because he called been calling paul a liar again and again and i will show you that your prophet as per the books and the attitude and the character that you salafis and wahhabis have given to him he is not even fit to untie the sandals or even clean the sand below the sandals of apostle paul now why i say as per the stories by the salafis and the wahhabis because honestly speaking i believe that there was a man uh, called uh, muhammad and all these stories were all you know he might have been a commander in the army or something like that and all these stories have been cooked up by the salafis and the wahhabis for their own selfish reasons otherwise the character of muhammad that is given from the islamic sources i cannot believe that a man like this existed who was such a horrible person so that is my take on this i'm i'm sure that he existed but not in the way of uh, the way the stories that have been cooked up by you in salafi and you wahhabis now on sunday this is two days down the line i'll be taking up the topic of because he's created a video on the satanic verses and i'll prove it to you beyond a shadow of doubt that muhammad quoted the satanic verses and muhammad was demon possessed so thank you again for your prayers and for your time and for being there and uh, all right so thank you again i look forward to seeing you on sunday till then stay safe stay blessed and god bless you bye bye